tonight on Metro News. Just one sleep to go, Mount Hutt slopes are ready with snow. We meet a group who are fast and furious. And New Zealand celebrates 30 years nuclear free. Kia ora, good evening. Welcome to your local news bulletin brought to you by the students of the New Zealand Broadcasting School. First up tonight, the countdown is almost over for skiers and snowboarders, with Mount Hutt ski fields set to open tomorrow. Preparing for the season is a huge undertaking, but as Talia Mamila reports, with climate change, the task is only set to grow. It's all on. The groomers are working, gears being set up, and staff are busy here at Mount Hutt. Well, we've had a good start. You know, um, we've got a reasonable base to begin operations on Friday. We've had three reasonably lean snow seasons. We're due a good season now because three in a row, we've got to have something good coming through. The team here at Mount Hutt are all prepared. They've got 20 to 40 centimetres of snow across the mountain, but that wouldn't have happened without the help from the snowmaking team. Man-made snow is a big part of the ski industry. The machines need compressed air, water and temperatures below negative 1.5 degrees. So those fine nozzles on the outside ring call nucleator, so they spraying really nice fine spray of water and the compressed air creating the initial crystal, the tiny tiny crystal. At Mount Hutt they're using the guns to help them start the season now but they're also part of preparing for the future. Some people say by 2090 that we'll have 30 less snowfall days a year, which is, um, a, which is a, a big reduction in the amount of snow that we have, and certainly in the high country, and for the ski fields that will have huge implications. It's something ski bosses are mindful of, but Mount Hutt's confident it's got its bases covered. We are seeing a change in climate, a warming, and uh, whilst it's very subtle, it's, it's probably getting to the point where we're kind of saying, well, it, there is something happening. The other important thing, obviously, is cold temperatures, because if the snow doesn't come out of the sky, we can make it. So if it stays cold, then we're happy with that as well. But it doesn't come cheap. It costs $60,000 for one of these snow machines and another 20000 to install. They have 88 guns here at Mount Hutt, and three of which are new this year. They've got the snow and good weather forecasts for eager skiers to kick the season off tomorrow. Talia Mamelo, Metro News. It's part of our national identity and fits our clean green image. 30 years ago today, New Zealand became nuclear free. Emmy Mackay has been talking to those involved in the campaign and joins us now. Emmy. Yes, on June the 8th, 1987, New Zealand was declared nuclear free, the first ever country to do so. The act pass passed by government bans any nuclear weapons in our land, sea and air spaces. It's still one of the strongest legislations worldwide and Cantabrians are keen to celebrate that. The year was 1987. A year of hit songs interesting fashion choices and New Zealand becoming nuclear free. 30 years later, they're still commemorating the day. The older and the younger. Time to remember those who had courage to stand up for their nation. Nuclear testings in the Pacific ignited a passionate response from Kiwis, forcing the 1987 Labour government to pass a law making the country nuclear free. So I think it's one of the iconic pieces of legislation that New Zealand has passed. It's part of our identity of who we are and it's something we can be proud of that we stood up to the big countries who bullied us and we've sustained that policy over 30 years. Campaigners still passionate about their cause, continuing the fight. And we've got cluster munitions banned, landmines banned, testing banned, but we need to have one now that says to all the nuclear weapon states, you come into line and you fulfil your obligation to get rid of all nuclear weapons. Even though they're banned in New Zealand, nuclear weapons are not yet outlawed internationally. And this month, four Kiwis will be travelling to the United Nations to try and change that. We'll be one of 130 nations hoping to negotiate a treaty to ban nuclear weapons worldwide. 
and closer to home, hoping the 30th anniversary will inspire future generations. I think there's a lot that young New Zealanders can learn from that in terms of how to bring a social movement together. And it's not just related to nuclear weapons, but climate change and um, sustainable development and all those issues as well. But the day will always serve as a reminder of what ordinary Kiwis can achieve. All we are saying. Anti-nuclear campaigners say that $12 million is still being spent every hour on funding nuclear weapons worldwide. This Sunday, four New Zealanders, including Kate Dew, will be travelling to the UN in the New York to try and negotiate a treaty to stop this. Their goal? A nuclear-free future for every nation. Thanks, Emi. Medical students and people on probation. Hard to imagine they've got much in common, but they've come together for, for a project that benefits both groups. Joey Dwyer reports on a health clinic with a difference. This might look like a Saturday morning cook school, but it's actually part of a fresh idea to teach offenders on probation the importance of healthy living. This health clinic put together by a group of fourth year Otago medical students. They create some kind of public health initiative, usually to do with sexual health, and um, they deliver that to a group in the community that experiences some um, challenges to access healthcare. Around 40 offenders on probation took up the service at the Department of Correction Centre. Four stations were set up. Sexual health provided screening for STIs, a dentist offered checkups, there was advice on eating well and information about health services in the community. It's been pretty hectic. We kind of didn't really know what we were going to get into when we arrived, as in we don't know how many people were actually going to come. This is the first time medical students have worked with those who are on probation and the response has been extremely positive. I found it really good. The corrections were really good for people, you know, to uh, help others who can't cook. Some people don't see their doctor so they can't afford it. While this is new here, overseas research shows how successful the concept can be to help offenders reintegrate into society and keep healthy. If you target certain populations um, in the prison and in the community that it has a, a wide impact on the broader community to reduce um, sexually transmitted diseases and the likes. With 1,600 people serving community sentences in Canterbury, this support is much needed. We've had really good feedback so far and they've found it really, really useful. As long as they can take one thing away with them, then hopefully that will be useful. And since they can rotate, they can try everything. <laughs> With the students able to celebrate a job well done, this service offers benefits for all. Joey Dwyer, Metro News. Fast and furious, boy races off the streets and drifting as part of a special event where everything is legal. Tom Peterson went along to the old Ruapuna Raceway to catch the action. A noise all too familiar to local residents. Christchurch streets have a reputation for being plagued by boy races. But a group of drift enthusiasts have lined up something that's all above board. The best place to do it is on the track. Um, it, when, when there's such low limitations, like you know, there's there's no massive gutters to hit. There's there's no houses you can, you know, hit or piss off neighbours or anything like that. You can come out here. The track's massive. The guys are all helpful. This is the city council's way of dealing with boy races, and this is street meets. Organised, controlled drifting car events. There was just a group of us that uh, were all building cars. Um, we, all st we started about 2008. Um, it wasn't, it's not really like an organisation as such or anything like that, it's just a group of friends. This, their most recent meet, was the biggest event ever in the South Island. Although the wet weather may have kept some spectators away, the Christchurch drift scene is looking bigger than ever, with upwards of 200 pit crew and drivers here at Mike Pirro Motorsport Park and raring to go. There's heaps of cars out here this weekend, not probably the most of you have seen. It's crazy how many people are coming from, from the North Island to just come to one of these events. It isn't about winning or losing though, it's a place for like-minded people to drive, or pitch in lending tools to get the best out of their cars. With the drifting community growing massively, those here say this is where the sport belongs. Get people off the streets, yeah. get them out here, all it costs you is about $100, cheaper than a speeding ticket. The team at Street Meet are pushing for more events like these, and encouraging the public to come out and give it a go. Who knows, your passion for the sport might kick into gear sooner than you think. Tom Peterson, Metro News. 
Coming up after the break, court jester Vanessa Wells joins us in the studio and student robberies are on the rise. My name's Chris Nicholl and I'm head of production for Capital FM Network. I'm doing TV, I'm doing online, I'm doing event audio and I'm working with a team of eight people. We make everything, every single sweeper, ident, thing that says what radio station you're listening to, what TV station you're watching. Broadcasting school put me in a scenario where I had to figure things out. Hands on learning, getting stuck in, teaching yourself stuff. It also prepared me for the sorts of people that you come in contact with in media and how to deal with situations, especially high stressful situations. The great thing was the tutors were really encouraging and really helpful. They were like senior members of staff in a real radio station. Nowhere else will you get hands-on learning that actually lands you in a real radio station doing real work as part of the course. I have freelanced at some fantastic places and made some really good friends just from being able to turn up and be nice and polite and professional. All of those things is what broadcasting school was really good at versing you in. Being in London, it's a melting pot of creativity and ideas and people. I'm doing stations in Iceland, Germany, America, New Zealand still, which is wonderful. I can't say I expected it to be quite like this, but it's awesome. Welcome back. First year flatting should be all about parties, foundry Thursdays and cheap meals. But for some students, burglaries are becoming an increasing part of student life. Ella Proud is covering the story. How bad is the problem, Ella? So it's hard to pin down exact numbers from police, but from what I'm told, there are six to seven incidents in the Rickerton area each week. And those are just the ones I know about. So thieves are going for anything, including bicycles and electrical items. Speaking to some students, they say they have caught burglars in the act, and some say they are living in fear. Liam Clark's your typical university student. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was pretty funny. Know? It was funny as yeah. when we got back, because we were pretty pissed. And <laughs> it was pretty funny to find him there. Burglars four times this year. I didn't have anything stolen the first two times, but Kane got a laptop stolen, Bill got a laptop stolen, um, and then they stole our PS4. And then the third time I stole everything I own, put my whole suitcase. The incident's unsettling many. I don't feel safe. It sucks. Like, thinking that someone's, like, round the house or trying to unlock our doors when we're sleeping, it's not fun. Police say some areas are being clearly targeted. Police have definitely seen an increase, and in this year alone, there's been 80 robberies in the Rickerton area. Clonburn is just one of the streets hit. Police say burglars usually strike on a Thursday, Friday or Saturday night when students tend to be drinking and are less cautious of home security. They say social first year flatters make them easy targets. Burglars know that and they also know that uh, these new students don't uh, put a lot of emphasis on their personal security. Some say old keys still in circulation could be a major part of the problem and landlords could do more. So if there was a way um, that legally at the change of each tenancy that an owner uh, had to change locks of each external door um, or put a keypad in and change the code, I think that would help to minimise a lot of things as well. For Liam, his thief wasn't a past tenant, but a convicted criminal who he managed to stop in his tracks. There was some guy walking just down there around the side of the house and so we like ran up to him and had to tell him to stop and wouldn't let him leave the property and stuff. One less offender on these streets, but the strong advice of police to others is, if you're going out, lock it or lose it. So something students are doing is warning each other about break-ins on the UCSA Facebook page. Police say it's great to share the information, but they have some advice. Keep valuables hidden from the window so they can't be seen. Get insurance. Make sure you report any suspicious behaviour. And they even recommend locking your doors throughout the day because burglars can strike even when students are home. Thanks, Ella. Stereotypes no longer apply. Thousands of Kiwi kids are signing up to after-school code clubs, proving digital technologies aren't geeky. I went along and found a bunch of students giving it a go. Every week these Breen's Intermediate kids gather at Code Club, keen to learn more. It's really fun and it's the skills we're going to need later in life. How simple most of the things are and what you can do with it. 
I really like that you can like do basically anything that you want with it and it's not that limited at all. There are skills much needed for the world these students will be working in. Coding is pr using computers and technology to program something to do what you want or to design something for a certain cause. The club's not just for kids into computers. You'd be surprised, um, a real eclectic mix of kids. There's no sort of real stereotype of who joins up. You know, your, your sporty kids, your, your kids that aren't necessarily that um, engaged in class that still like to get into coding and kids that are just curious. Teachers agree. Some are really talkative and really into the internet and being online. Some are really good at designing and quite creative. Others are quiet and that's kind of their safe space. Code Club's a worldwide movement that made it here three years ago. There are 270 coding clubs in New Zealand, with 65 of those here in Christchurch. Classes are free, it's a not-for-profit organisation. And kids' interest in coding is growing exponentially, with 10 to 15 coding clubs starting across the country every month. This isn't just extra screen time. There's a new project to master every week, new language to learn. I'm currently making stickers with HTML and CSS, so this one here is the one that I've been doing at the moment and I'm going to make some more soon. Keeping ahead of the game is a constant challenge for schools. There's a lot more jobs that will come through uh, in the years to come that will involve coding or some sort of digital technology. So code clubs are likely to stay, helping kids of all interests and backgrounds get a step ahead. Rachel Das, Metro News. The New Zealand International Comedy Festival may be over, but the lack of female comics is an ongoing issue. To help get more young women involved, the Court Theatre is running an inter-school competition. Lauren Jones joins us in the studio with Vanessa Wells to talk about the initiative. Lauren. Thanks, Kethke, and thanks, Vanessa, for being here today. No so what is theatre sports exactly? Well, it's a form of improvised comedy, or well, improvised theatre actually, but it often does end up to be straight comedy. And it just puts a bit of a competitive spin on it. So you could be creating scenes and then you have judges who are judging the games or whatever and giving points. So you can have quite a, you know, quite a good solid format. So it's a great way for people to get, get their teeth into improvised theatre. Right. So why is there a need for more girls in, in this? Oh, that's a perennial problem, is trying to get sort of more women and girls involved in, in theatre, um, in comedy in particular. I think um, it's something where often uh, uh, girls are not as front-footed or as aggressive on the stage when it comes to comedy, and sometimes you just need that opportunity to be able to get brave and try things without having your ideas swamped or squashed. And that was the whole idea behind sort of creating this workshop. Right. So when is the workshop? It's on Sunday. So it's this Sunday. And uh, it's a full day workshop and it's being run by three of the female court jesters. Um, we've got quite a strong team of, of women in the court jesters at the moment, which is fantastic. Um, so it's great that you know three of them are there to help encourage the, the high school students. So do you think theatre sports can help young women? Absolutely. I, I think improvised theatre in general just provides you with fantastic life skills. You know, you're working as a team, you're finding the, 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 the fun side of life. It's, it's about um, being creative and, and working together and, and finding positive solutions and all those kinds of things. It's far bigger than just what you happen to be doing on stage. Yeah. yeah. So why do you think girls perhaps maybe struggle with comedy sometimes? I, I think that, that it's starting to change. Um, the Fred Award at the recent New Zealand Comedy um, Comedy Festival was won by Rose Matafio, and so and that's only the second time in over ten years that it's been won by a, a woman. So I think that's a really big thing, and I think Funny Girls on TV Three has been really popular as well. So I think it is starting to change, but unless women are brave enough to get out there and kind of you know push themselves forward you know, that, that could ease off. So I think we need to carry on trying to get women, you know, through and starting it. Yeah, and for a final question, what would you say to a young girl that's too nervous to try out theatre sports but kind of wants to do it? Oh, the nerves are kind of why you do it. You know, you get that thrill and, um, and this is a great opportunity to just get brave. I think you do just need to park those concerns and stop judging yourself and just get out there and give it a shot. Great. Thanks for being here, Vanessa. Back to you, Rachel. Thanks, Lauren. After the break on Metro News, we tell you how the weather's looking for the rest of the week, and a new city attraction could have surfers riding a different wave.
My name's Alistair Coburn. Uh, I'm the station producer for Classic FM. So we're in London, we've got eight radio stations and two TV stations here. So I've been doing this job about two years. Got a phone call while I was in uh, the middle of Europe saying you've got a job interview in London. Worked out quite well. London's the greatest city on earth, I think. There's so much to do here. It's, it's just such a vibrant place. My first year in the UK, I think we saw about 10 different countries. Two weeks ago, we were in Wales. A week before that, we were in Prague. It's really amazing. I mean, Classic FM, We've got 5.3 million listeners every week, so it's more than the entire New Zealand population. I'll be writing promos, writing trails, writing imaging, writing commercials as well. I got nominated for a Sony Radio Award for a promotional campaign which I worked on. The skills that I've got from, from my study, they really stand up. It taught me a lot about how the entire radio industry works, like from sales to production to on-air to writing. Once you're done, you've got the internship, you get straight into a job, and from there, you're off. I mean the world's your oyster, basically. Welcome back. A Christchurch local is looking to bring a new type of attraction to the city. If he gets his way, surfers may soon be riding a different wave. Brad Christensen has the story. When the waves are good, local surfers are riding high. But more often than not, the sea is flat. Here in Christchurch we're not that fortunate as far as conditions for surfing goes. But he has a vision, a wave pool in a park-like setting like this, that had become a surfer's paradise. We're trying to come in like cap with the downhill mountain bike park with the emphasis on fun. Uh, it fits perfectly within the residential red zone plan. He's keen to build a lake with a wave making machine one capable of producing hundreds of perfect waves per hour. Having the wave pool, you can surf all the time, better your skills and whatnot. Yeah. Consistent waves are always good to have. Although locals would love it, Nick Mooney believes the facility could bring in some big names. We've already seen um, a number of uh, groups turn up at the Wave Garden headquarters in Spain to put their teams through their paces before the ISA World Games recently. Um, we'd be hoping to attract the same sort of teams to New Zealand um, to train within the pools uh, with upcoming Olympics over the years. With plans for the Wave Pool already in motion, Nick Mooney is looking for support from the local surf community. And by the sounds of things, he won't have far to look. Sounds great, there's lots of, that, lots of area out in the red zones. I think the kids would really enjoy it, and some of us older adults as well. It'll keep the learners out of the water and like it'll, it'll just be safe for all around for everybody concerned. I think it's a great idea because it's something to do when the swell's not working then we've got somewhere to go isn't it? Nick Mooney is still organising plans and finance but is hoping Regenerate Christchurch will also come on board. Christchurch needs us. We're a boring city and we need fun things that are going to keep people coming back. Brad Christensen, Metro News. They say the early bird catches the worm, but in Christchurch, on a cold morning, the early biker catches coffee and a donut. I rode along to grab a bite to eat. It's a typical early morning in Christchurch, dark and very cold. But these cyclists have a sunny disposition. They're being rewarded by local groups for biking into work. A local bike shop's behind the idea. We give free uh, coffee and muffins, or donuts in this case, to people riding bikes. This is the second biker breakfast, something they hope to repeat every season. While at first the traffic was slow, cyclists were soon arriving in droves. A local councillor among the two wheelers. There's already increasing numbers on all of the cycleways that are built already, or the sections of them, so we're looking forward to more and more cyclists as time goes on. Cycleways are a focus for local and national roading planners. There's 30 new cycleways being developed in Christchurch and these Cantabrians are embracing this alternative way of commuting to work. And the coffee is not bad either. Local anti-climate change groups amongst it today, hoping Christchurch will be the cycling capital of New Zealand. If we have a big cycling population, that's going to be incredible because it would be better for drivers, it would be better for pedestrians, it would be better for our city in terms of carbon emissions. Um, so yeah, it's, it's an easy solution. And it looks like Cantabrians are getting behind the cause. They think Christchurch should be a city where everyone bikes to work. I love it, it's flat. Um, I think that cycling kind of makes everyone happier. It's every person who's on a bike has one less car on the road, um, which is great for everybody. And events like this, an extra reward for those already along for the ride. Keith Kimasalamani, Metro News. Katie's here now with the weather. How's the rest of the week looking, Katie? 
Well, it's looking a bit chilly, so if you're heading out, you want to make sure you pack a few extra layers. It's been a fairly fine day for much of the country, with the west coast experiencing most of the sun. Christchurch got off to a pretty nippy zero degree start, hitting a high of 12. You may want to bring out the sunnies tomorrow. The Garden City is set to have a bright and clear day. But temperature-wise, we're not seeing any improvements with a high of 12. Further, further south, the clear weather is set to continue tomorrow. Clear skies for Timaru and Ashburton, but expected to just hit double digits. Twizel, it'll be a clear day for you too, but you may want to chuck on a few extra layers as your expected high is 7. Looking further north, tomorrow is looking pretty good for you too. Hanma and Oxford reaching 10 and 12 degrees, and Kaikoura, you're the place to be. The day will be full of sun with a high of 14 degrees. Looking forward to the rest of the week, Canterbury is set to have cold nights and cloudy days. Saturday, some showers are expected to develop throughout the day, so pack a brolly if you're going to be out and about. Enjoy the rest of your evening. That is all from me. Back to you, Kefiki and Rachel. Thanks, Katie. And that's Metro News for tonight. For those stories and more, head to our website, metronews.co.nz. And you can also find us on Facebook and Twitter. Join us again tomorrow night. I'm Rachel Das. And I'm Kepiki Masalamani. Ka, Ka kite, kite anō. anō.